woman can never be defined. Tell Kel, a different relationship to the text becomes manifest in our practice, and it is one in which you participate. Could you be more specific with regard to how your work is the work of a woman, or rather, how does being a woman have a bearing upon this type of endeavor? How does the women's struggle, an activity in which you seem to want to involve yourself more and more, transform something in your relationship to writing, to the text, to theoretical and textual production? Christeva. The belief that one is a woman is almost as absurd and obscurantist as the belief that one is a man. I say almost because there are still many goals which women can achieve, freedom of abortion and contraception, daycare centers for children, equality on the job, etc. Therefore, we must use we are women as an advertisement or slogan for our demands. On a deeper level, however, a woman cannot be. It is something which does not even belong to the order of being. It follows that a feminist practice can only be negative, at odds with what already exists, so that we may say, that's not it, and that's still not it. In woman, I see something that cannot be represented, something that is not said, something above and beyond nomenclatures and ideologies. There are certain men who are familiar with this phenomenon. It is what some modern texts never stop signifying, testing the limits of language and sociality, the law and its transgression, mastery and sexual pleasure, without reserving one for males and the other for females, on the condition that it is never mentioned. From this point of view, it seems that certain feminist demands revive a kind of naive romanticism, a belief in identity, the reverse of phallocratism, if we compare them to the experience of both poles of sexual difference, as is found in the economy of Joycean or Artoian prose, or in modern music, Cage, Stockhausen. I pay close attention to the particular aspect of the work of the avant-garde which dissolves identity, even sexual identities. And in my theoretical formulations, I try to go against metaphysical theories that censure what I labeled a woman, that is what, I think, makes my research that of a woman. Perhaps I should add something here, and it's not contradictory to what I just said. Because of the decisive role that women play in the reproduction of the species, and because of the privileged relationship between father and daughter, a woman takes social constraints even more seriously, has fewer tendencies toward anarchism, and is more mindful of ethics. This may explain why our negativity is not Nietzschean anger, if my work aims at broadcasting to the public precisely what this society censures in the avant-garde practice, then, I think, my work obeys ethical exigencies of this type. The whole problem is to know whether this ethical penchant in the woman's struggle will remain separated from negativity, in which case the ethical penchant will degenerate into conformity, and negativity will degenerate into esoteric perversion. The problem is on the agenda of the women's movement. But without the movement, no work of any woman could ever really be possible. Tell Kel, you have just returned from China. We would like very much to visit China, but it seems to us that our real China is here, where we transform reality. What we want to know is, where is your China? The results of the work we do here with women, among women, often overlap with what is being produced, or so we hear, by men and women in China. Among other things, an upheaval, perhaps the disappearance, or the lack of phallic dominance in both struggle and celebration. During your trip, what did you experience with regard to this difference? Christeva. I have returned from China after a three-week trip to Peking, Shanghai, Luoyang, Shan, and back to Peking, where I met many men and women, workers, peasants, schoolchildren, teachers, artists. But with all this... And regardless of my own studies in Chinese, there is nothing less certain than having been in China in its space and time. Traveling to China is tantamount to examining what is new and novel on this planet, phenomena that are both sexual and political upheavals. In the eyes of a Westerner, China joins the two. The struggle for the emancipation of women, the trend toward abolishing social inequalities, together with the emergence of an immense repressed culture into the worldwide political arena. But all of this interests me, especially with regard to this impossible phenomenon that is attempting to assert itself in our society. 
the avant-garde, the women's struggle, and the battle for socialism are merely symptomatic of the impossible on different levels. How will the West greet the awakening of the third world, as the Chinese call it? Can we participate actively and lucidly in this awakening when the center of the planet is in the process of moving toward the East? If you don't care about women, if you don't like women, you needn't bother going to China. You wouldn't hear anything. You'll be bored, and you'll even run the risk of getting sick, either with understanding nothing or understanding everything. First of all, ancient China was, if not a matriarchal society, as modern Chinese historians follow Engels in asserting, then at least the best-known and most highly developed matrilinear society. Later, even during the period of Confucius, when women were considered slaves or little men, wives played an essential role in family life and even in the sacred representation of reproductive relations. But most important is the fact that today an immense effort is being made to give women an active role not only in the home, but on all levels of political and social activity. This is one of the main stakes in the present critical campaign waged against Lin Piao and Confucius. Freedom of abortion and contraception, equal pay for equal work, encouragement in aesthetic, political and scientific endeavours, educational opportunities, adequate health care for mothers and young children, safe nurseries and play areas. These are just a few of the things that I could see in each production unit that we visited in China. Furthermore, in all the performances that we saw, films, plays, operas, not one of them had a man as its main character. There was always a heroine. It's very difficult to describe briefly the relationship between the trend toward emancipation and the phallic principle, or let's say its relationship to power. I shall discuss this very issue in greater detail in my forthcoming book on Chinese women to be published by the Edition des Femmes. What is clear is that the problems that face Chinese women who are emerging from a feudal Confucian society have nothing to do with the problems of Western women who are trying to get out from under the thumbs of capitalism and monotheism. Therefore, it is absurd to question their lack of sexual liberation, just as it is absurd to project the realization of a so-called universal revolutionary ideal upon their style of life and struggle. Here are a few empirical observations. In spite of the value assigned to women in today's campaign, in spite of man's dominance in the Confucian patriarchal family, I do not get the impression that reproductive and symbolic representations were determined by what we, in the West, call the phallic principle. First, the differences between the sexes is not as huge as you might imagine. Men and women are not two races at war with one another. Man is in woman and woman is in man. The so-called sexual relations do not seem to be centered around transgression, the quest for partial objects, perversion, etc. Genitality, in other words, the passage through the edible stage, if I may use certain psychoanalytic concepts, but oh so very carefully, seems to underlie this scene and creates a relaxed, calm, maternal atmosphere in public, on the job, even during holidays such as May 1st. It is an ambience without the allure of romance. There is firmness or strength without the threat of violence. Chinese writing is what corresponds best to this rhythm. In any case, it is impossible to talk about Chinese socialism unless we take into account the fact that it is structured around a different distribution of sexual difference, and hence the roles women will occupy within this structure. Of course, nothing has been accomplished, and nothing guarantees that the present efforts will not be engulfed by the ever-present revisionist tide or by a return to the bourgeois system. On this level, just as in economics and politics, the struggle between the Two defense lines is not a slogan, but an everyday truth. Talcal. Just as feminine is the reverse of masculine, feminism can be seen as the reverse of humanism. We struggle against this ideology that produces only inversion. Without, however, forgetting what each one of us must recognize as our own minimum feminism, our own temporary arena. In this regard, it seems to us that the women's struggle cannot be divorced from revolutionary struggle, class struggle, or anti-imperialism. The issues that are crucial in our practice involve the notion of the subject, its fragmentation, the inscription of heterogeneity, difference. These are issues that feminism skirts by postulating that women are separate, complete individuals with their own identity. 
or by demanding such things as names for women, etc. How can we conceive of a revolutionary struggle that does not involve a revolution in discourse, not an upheaval in language as such, but rather a theory of this very upheaval? We run the risk of creating within feminism an enclosed ideology parallel to the ideology of the dominant class. And what of the impasses these demands will meet if they remain on the social level? Christopher. Feminism can be but one of capitalism's more advanced needs to rationalize. Giscard d'Estaing, wishing to liquidate certain Gaullist archaisms, invented the secretary for the status of women. It's better than nothing, but it's not exactly right either. In the 20th century, after suffering through fascism and revisionism, we should have learned that there can be no socio-political transformation without a transformation of subjects. In other words, in our relationship to social constraints, to pleasure, and more deeply, to language. What is politically new today can be seen and felt in modern music, cartoons, communes of young people, provided they do not isolate themselves on the fringes of society, but participate in the contradiction inherent in political classes. The women's movement, if it has a raison d'etre, seems to be part of this trend. It is, perhaps, one of its most radical components. In every political apparatus, whether on the right or the left, the movement, by its negativity, indicates what is otherwise repressed. That class consciousness, for example, is not unrelated to the unconscious of the sex speaker. The trap that is set for this demystifying force, a force that the women's movement can be, is that we will identify with the power principle that we think we are fighting. The hysterical saint plays her pleasure against social order, but in the name of God. The question, who plays God in present-day feminism? Man or woman, his substitute? As long as any libertarian movement, feminism included, does not analyze its own relationship to power and does not renounce belief in its own identity, it remains capable of being co-opted both by power and an overtly religious or lay Spiritualism. Besides, it is spiritualism's last great hope. The solution is infinite, since what is at stake is to move from a patriarchal society, of class and of religion, in other words, from prehistory, toward who knows. In any event, this process involves going through what is repressed in discourse, in reproductive and productive relationships, Call it woman or the oppressed social class. It's the same struggle, and you never have one without the other. It seems to me that the movement's most urgent task is to make the ideological and political machines understand this complicity. But this implies that we change our style, that we get out a bit from among women, from among ourselves, that each one of us in our respective fields fights against social and cultural archaisms.